After the fall of the Akkadian Empire, Mesopotamia went through what's known as a Dark Age. Like the name suggests, we have very little information about what exactly was going on during that time, at least politically. Mesopotamian tradition accords the fall of the Akkadian Empire to several factors. However, the most blame goes to a people from the Zagros Mountains known as the Guti, or Gutians. The story goes that due to the displeasure of the gods, Hordes of savage Gutians were released onto Mesopotamia like locusts, causing destruction wherever they went. Accounts of the Gutians in various literature from ancient Mesopotamia contain both gross exaggerations as well as outright fiction. One has to realize though that societies often create scapegoats for their problems, the case of the Gutians and the fall of the Akkadian Empire being no exception. In Mesopotamian literature, they're described as simple mountaineers who couldn't read or write in any language, worshipped unknown gods and spirits, and for all practical purposes, were the polar opposite of the urban, sophisticated Sumerians. Somehow though, in 2154 BCE, they captured the old Akkadian capital of Agade and defeated Shutural, the ruler there who claimed to be of the same line of Akkadian kings that had begun with Sargon the Great. Most scholars, though, place the real end of the Akkadian Empire to the year 2193 BCE with the death of Shar Kali Shari, but for our purposes, this is a moot point. By 2150 BCE, the glory days of the Akkadian Empire were long gone. By then, there was only uncertainty and instability. Scholars still don't know exactly what transpired in Mesopotamia after the fall of Agade. Though it's said that the Gutians ruled over Mesopotamia, this may have actually been only in name. Perhaps they simply just exacted tribute from various city-states of Sumer and Akkad. It's very possible that many city-states may have been totally independent. The truth is that due to the lack of sources, we just don't know. Around the year 2021 BCE, there was a man in the city of Uruk who went by the name Utuhegao. There are several stories about his early beginnings, but most scholars, based on what they've gathered from various textual sources, believe that Utuhegal was the governor of Uruk. Though technically working for the Gutian regime, he's portrayed in ancient texts as a proud Sumerian. Sick of Gutian rule and perhaps seeing an opportunity, Utuhegal revolted against the Gutian king, Tirigan, and amassed a sizable army of what we'll call Sumerian patriots. He faced Tirigan in battle and defeated his troops, forcing the Gutian ruler and his men to flee towards the Zagros Mountains. After his victory, which transformed him from a petty governor to that of a great Sumerian hero, Utuhegal established himself as the king of Uruk. His reign though was short, and in its seventh year, he reportedly died in an accident, supposedly while inspecting one of Uruk's canals. He was succeeded by his son-in-law, the former governor of Ur, a man who went by the name Ur-Namu. Like Utuhegal, not much is known about Ur-Namu's early years. It's believed that he may have been given the governorship of Ur after helping Utuhegal defeat the Gutians. There are also some scholars who believe that he was Utuhegal's brother, but this is a minority view. What is known is that Ur-Namu was married to Utuhegal's daughter, thus making him a legitimate heir to the kingdom. In 2112 BCE, he established a new Sumerian dynasty, which scholars call the Third Dynasty of Ur. It's also known as the Neo-Sumerian Dynasty because it revitalized the old Sumerian language and traditions of Sumer from before the days of Sargon and the Akkadian kings. Now, you could say that Ur-Namu's reign was one of Sumerian nationalism. I think though that a better phrase would be Sumerian Renaissance. That's the term that many historians also use. As the capital of his new kingdom, he chose the historically significant city of Ur, and after securing his position, went on to conquer, or perhaps absorb without much of a fight, the cities of Uma, Lagash, and Iridu. Thus, he united most of the Sumerian south under his banner. Ruling from 2112 to 2095 BCE, Ur-Namu presented himself not only as the rightful heir of Sumer, but also the inheritor of the Akkadian legacy of Sargon the Great. 
He instituted a kind of patrimonial state in which his subjects saw him as a sort of father figure or shepherd, tending to and protecting his flock from wolves and other wild animals. He created a code of laws which some believe to have been the first written code in history. The code I'm referring to was comprised of 40 paragraphs and contained both civil and criminal offenses along with their punishments. Here are some examples, and I quote, If a man committed a kidnapping, he is to be imprisoned and pay 15 shekels of silver. If a man appeared as a witness and was shown to be a perjurer, he must pay 15 shekels of silver. If a man knocked out the eye of another man, he shall weigh out half a mina of silver. If a man knocked out a tooth of another man, he shall pay two shekels of silver. If a man, in the course of a scuffle, smashed the limb of another man with a club, he shall pay one mina of silver. Capital punishment was reserved for more serious crimes, such as murder or adultery. When you examine the code further, and in the context of its time and location, the punishments were rather lenient. A few centuries later, there'd be another code, the famous one attributed to Hammurabi. In that code, you had a sort of tit-for-tat, eye-for-an-eye disbursement of justice. There's basically a lot of corporal and capital punishment in Hammurabi's and later law codes, especially those of the Assyrians. However, such punishments were not the hallmark of Urnamu's law code. In the latter, it seems that one could pay their way out of the majority of crimes. Urnamu also commissioned many building projects throughout Sumer as well. New public squares for religious gatherings and festivals were built in all of the leading cities. He also ordered the building of many canals, renovated existing ones, had gardens and orchards planted, and overall improved the economy of Sumer after so many years of stagnation. However, his most celebrated construction was the Great Ziggurat of Ur, which was a massive steppe pyramid dedicated to the moon god, Nana. Its ruins are still visible to this day. Urnamu essentially created the required stability needed for the revitalization of Sumerian art and culture, especially that of the Sumerian language. Sumerian replaced the use of Akkadian in everyday life and once again became the most widely spoken and official language of the land. New written works of poetry and prose were composed and compiled during this period, all in Sumerian. These improvements in people's lives made Urnamu quite popular, at least according to the various inscriptions that have been uncovered. In the year 2095 BCE, the Gutians returned with a new assault on Sumer. We're told that Urnamu personally led his army into battle, during which he was killed. This incident was immortalized in the Sumerian poem, the death of Urnamu and his descent into the underworld. It's a very unique work, basically a royal hymn that both ensured his popularity and immortality for generations to come. The Gutians, though, had little respite from Urnamu's death, as his son, Shulgi, took over the throne and drove them completely out of Sumer and back to the Zagros Mountains. He then conquered the rest of Mesopotamia and expanded the third dynasty of Ur's territories, tributaries, and overall influence, from the eastern Mediterranean on one end to the distant kingdom of Marhashi on the other. We'll take a look at the life of Shulgi in the next episode. Once again, thank you so much for stopping by the channel. I really appreciate it, and I really hope you learned something. If you did, please hit that like button and consider subscribing. Thanks again, and I'll catch you next time.